Good morning. This is Dina Marie, host of Faith Moments and the Voice of the Shepherd with a Saint Moment on Mater Day Radio. On March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, it seems as if everyone is a little bit Irish. It's a day where we wear green and don the three-leaf shamrock and traditions that reach beyond our Catholic community. But what do we really know about St. Patrick? And did we know that he really wasn't from Ireland? Well, with me today is Father James Kubicki to give us some insights on St. Patrick and how he can help us on our Lenten journey. Welcome back, Father James. Great to have you back with us today. Thank you, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Well, it well, is. Saint Patrick. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, well, St. Patrick, he was born around the year 387, so back way back in the fourth century, which, um, you know, the Roman Empire was still uh, alive. I wouldn't say it was well, it was ailing, uh, but it was still in control of Great Britain. And that's where um, St. Patrick was born, on the British Isle. And um, the Romans, during his youth, left England left Britain. And as a result, um, life was up for grabs. Uh, there were pirates from Ireland who came and started pillaging the countryside and in fact, kidnapped Patrick and took him to Ireland where he was enslaved. He became uh, a herdsman. He would watch over the flocks of um, a wealthy Irish landowner. And uh, during the six years that he was in captivity there, um, he, he experienced a conversion um, during that long time that he was quiet at night watching the flocks or during the daytime, he prayed. And he said, at one point, he, he said, you know, he prayed a hundred prayers during the day and just as many at night. And so in his loneliness and in his uh, lack of freedom, his enslavement, he turned to God. And isn't that often the case that when we experience a crisis in our lives or in our world, in our country, um, people turn to God. And um, But uh, Patrick did not let that be just something he did at a time of crisis because he had a dream in which he was told it was time for him to escape. And so he escaped. He caught a ship that took him back to Britain. And um, he did not forget the Irish people. In fact, he had another dream in which he uh, sensed or experienced people from Ireland telling him, come back, come back and give us and bring us the gospel, bring us Jesus. And so in time, he was ordained a priest and a bishop and was sent back as a bishop to Ireland, where he began evangelizing, speaking with, with the pagan leaders and kings and people, and uh, they received the gospel open uh, heartedly and um, the, the, we had one of the great conversion uh, conversion experiences in history with Ireland, the first country by the way in Europe that became Christian without any martyrs. So the, um, other countries experienced martyrdom like France and Spain, but in Ireland there were no martyrs and it was totally through the efforts, the holiness, the teaching of St. Patrick. So inspiring the life of St. Patrick and to see um, his conversion, you know, when he was a, a, taken as a slave, he was a teenager. I just think about this young man over several years having to kind of be this shepherd, but um, his heart changed. And I think about the hope of our young people who desire truth, who desire good, who desire God. Great things are coming from our young people like they came from St. Patrick. Right. And, you know, it's a result of prayer. Um, I know if, uh, many young people are drawn, for example, here in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, there is a, a weekly prayer uh, with uh, mass, but it's preceded by um, worship and praise music and also with uh, time for confession. And, uh, and the pe young people are, are flocking to this church. It's, uh, they call the, uh, the weekly program Cor Jesu, Heart of Jesus. So I think at prayer was, you know, at, at the heart of Patrick's conversion, but also that prayer led him to be forgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, he could have carried away a great resentment toward the Irish people who had enslaved him. But instead, prayer softened his heart 
and made him open to receiving the guidance to return and bring to them Jesus. Jesus on the cross gives us the great example of forgiveness when he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so as Patrick was, was praying with the life of Jesus, um, those words touched him that he did not hold the resentment. And I think for us during this season of Lent, as we look to how we need to be purified or where we need a conversion in our hearts, uh, as we prepare perhaps for a reconciliation service in our churches, it be important. It would be important for us to consider, you know, do I hold any resentments against anyone? Uh, are there people that I feel in my heart I would never want to see again? Uh, and to start praying for them and praying God would bless them if they need a conversion, to bring them to a conversion just the way the, uh, the Lord brought the Irish people to a conversion uh, through the prayers and sacrifice of St. Patrick. Right. We're talking about the life of St. Patrick, of course, or his feast day is on the 17th of March. Father James Kubicki with me and that time after time, when we talk about the saints, Father, we hear about that change in their heart, their love of God helps them to forgive. I think last month um, we didn't talk about St. Josephine Bakita, but what an amazing story. Again, a young slave brought into slavery as a young, young girl, but she grew to forgive those who offended her. And again, uh, the, those stories are the stories that remind us um, to open our hearts. And, and this is a time uh, for us to do such things. And it takes prayer. It takes time and penance. It takes time with one another. Um, some thoughts you have of just how we could use this Lenten. It's a gift, I think, to the church to give us 40 days to spend mm -hmm. in a different way. The liturgy is different. It's penitential. The readings are rich. But if we are really holding something deep in our hearts, a grudge, an anger, uh, maybe an unforgiveness, uh, to work through that during this time. That's right. You know, two of the Lenten practices are prayer and fasting. And when we think of fasting, we think uh, most of all of fasting from different foods, uh, sweets or desserts or, or meat. Um, but perhaps our prayer, especially if we're um, looking at our enemies, people that have hurt us in any way, or people from whom we've been alienated in our family, or enemies of our nation, um, if we were to pray about them and pray for them, um, perhaps that would help us to fast from negative thinking, from anger, resentment. And, uh, and that can lead, at least in our hearts, to reconciliation. Uh, this is so important because um, we cannot go into heaven if we're holding on to a grudge or a resentment. There's no room in heaven for negative thinking about others. Uh, for unforgiveness. And so we have this uh, time of Lent as, as a beautiful season where we take stock of our lives and we ask ourselves, you know, where do I need conversion of heart? And uh, perhaps it's, you know, those ways that we uh, look at other people negatively because they're from a different political party or from a different nation or whatever it may be. What's important for us is never to let any negative feelings turn into a resentment. And as soon as we feel uh, a negative feeling towards someone to turn that into a prayer, as you said, Dina Marie, St. Josephine Bakhita or uh, St. Patrick are both examples of uh, praying. And I think of living out one of my favorite scripture passages is Romans 8, 28, where it says, God makes everything work together for the good of those whom he loves. And I think in both cases, we have saints who were enslaved and who found God in the midst of their enslavement and, uh, and afterwards would say, you know, if it had not been for that uh, bad experience uh, that brought me to my knees, made me depend more upon God, uh, if it hadn't been for that, I would not be the person I am today. And so there are great examples of how God used something that uh, on the outside would appear to be very negative, uh, God turned it into a great good for them. Absolutely. Well, such inspiration coming from the life of St. Patrick. And I know we did receive in the Diocese of Seattle, and I'm pretty sure the Diocese of Portland, a dispensation that we can celebrate fully the St. Patrick Day Feast with corned beef 
on a Friday if we choose to. Is that the case in your area? Well, it is too. Uh, Archbishop Jerome Listecki, the Archbishop of, of Milwaukee, gave us um, permission to to have a corned beef and cabbage, <laughs> corned beef the meat on on right St. Patrick, which is a Friday. But I'll, I'll be honest, Dina Marie, I I it's more of a penance for me maybe to eat corned beef than it is to eat fish because I, <laughs> I love right. fish. So um, maybe that will be a part of my penance on on uh, St. Patrick's Day. That's right. Well, let's continue to pray for the saints and ask them to pray for us. And would you help us close, Father James, with your prayer and blessing? Happy to do so. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that your grace is at work in the lives of people, in the lives of the saints, the life of the church, in our lives. We ask that nothing may hold us back. Nothing may hold us back from your love and the mercy that you have for us and that you want for our world. We pray especially that you give us a blessing during this Lenten season, that our hearts may be more like the heart of Jesus. And may your blessing come upon all the people that are listening and our family and friends in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father James, and have a blessed St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. You too, Dina Marie.